Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, mm -hmm. wherever you are. Hi, everybody. Nice Hi, all participants. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. 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 Hi. Nice to see you here again in another event of Global Thursday Talks. From, from all over the world, we are having participants, we are having guests. That's, that's very nice to see you here and we are honored tonight. Uh, it is night or evening, late evening in Ankara. That's why I, I say tonight. Uh, we are having a very active, very active in, in its word meaning, very active person, educator, pedagogue and intellectual. Uh, from a rare, from a rare region of the world, northern European countries. She is a representative of pedagogy. She is a representative of vocational and technical education, and she devoted her life, whole life, to uh, vocational and technical education and critical pedagogy, and. She, she has quite a lot of publications and quite a lot of, you know, program initiatives everywhere all over the world. And I'm honored to have Lu Mielde today from Norway. She is, she is uh, attending our event today from Norway, Oslo. Hi, Lu. Welcome. Thank you. We are honored to have you here. Okay, Eda, floor is yours. Hi everyone, as ever, I'm going to talk about the flow and the overall organization. And then I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mizukaji and uh, Dr. Mielde. After that, we will start our interview. We will be using a PowerPoint and it will be a question and answer um, talk, mm -hmm. let's say. It will take around an hour. So uh, during the interview, please stay mute and uh, feel free to use the chat box, please, for your comments and questions. After the event, we just collect them and send them to our speakers. And after they reply, we will be happy to send the answers to you. So make sure you add your email address as well. If you feel, um, if, if, you, if you wish, you can just send a private message to me as well on the chat box. Uh, today we will have a dialogue with uh, Dr. Mielde, as Fatma Jam says. Uh, now let me introduce Dr. Fatma Muzukaja and our speaker, Dr. Mielde. Uh, Dr. Muzukaja specialized in curriculum and instruction and uh, she is currently an associate professor at Ankara University, Turkey. And uh, she has been recently hosting Global Thursday Talks on Education. And uh, our speaker, uh, Liv Mielde, is professor in vocational pedagogy. She's a sociologist by training and a specialist in sociology of education, especially studying the changing relations between vocational and general education from psychological, didactic, and sociological perspectives. One of her research fields is gender divisions as they can be observed directly in vocational education in male and female occupational fields in relation to movements on the labor market and in family ideology. Uh, Mielde has published in several languages and has been the keynote speaker in many international conferences and uh, evaluation of Leonardo da Vinci programs for the European Union Commission has been part of her work. And Dr. Mielde has been the Norwegian project leader at Kionbago University, Uganda, uh, between 2007 to 2011, building up a master's degree in vocational pedagogy with students from Uganda and Southern Sudan. So uh, please help me welcoming Dr. Liv Mielde. Mm -hmm. So floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I want might be to say that I'm very impressed by you in 
Ankara. The women who are really taking the initiative and doing the work that is behind this webinar. It's very impressive. Uh, I think that might be, I would start out uh, with uh, showing you a cover slide. Uh, if you can do that, Edda. Um, I think that uh, number three is what I, I want to show you first. The, the <laughs> cover slide number three. Just a second, please. Yeah, yes, yes. We will. Yes, here you see, I will say a little bit of, uh, of colors in the rest I'm going to do. It's going to be very, a lot of text, you know, and here you see a picture. And this is actually a picture from uh, Uganda, from Kiambogo University in Uganda, where we had the pleasure uh, to work for, um, I think, four or five years, with building up in praxis a master's in vocational pedagogy. And I will uh, return to this matter later in my talk today. But I just wanted to see you to see a picture before I start to, to present the texts. So might be we should go to uh, talk a little bit. I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about my own praxis. Um, and I will say that uh, I have uh, had a wonderful experience being 18 years um, in a huge vocational um, school in Norway, the Song Vocational School, the Norway's Mecca of Trade and Industry. That was the dream of the 50s. And I think that you, you could show, show what, what the Minister of Education, the next uh, slide. And the Labour Minister, yes, the next slide. The Labour Minister of Education said in 1952 that the, the, the goal was that practical schools must be brought into the public consciousness and placed where they belonged side by side with general academic education. That was the goal after the Second World War of the Labour parties. It might be in other places in Europe, but this big um, vocational school was actually built, uh, built up to, to uh, yes, that you should be more, um, you should give esteem to the work of Han. Um, next, uh, um, yeah, it had actually 3,500 sc uh, students in the school there every year. It had a combination of work, of learning in vocational schools and learning in apprenticeship in working life. Most students were between 16 and 20 years old um, and they ended up after these four years with a skilled worker craft certificate. But this, um, uh, this uh, you can say this um, uh, situation we had there was going to has changed a lot uh, till today. We live in many ways in, in a very different um, situation, but I will return to that later. Can you show the next slide, please? Yes, I have in my, I have written a book called The Magical Properties of Workshop Learning. And here in there, that book, I described the workshop as a place where you learn together and you cooperate. That could be in a hospital ward, it could be in a kitchen, it could be in, uh, for me in vocational pedagogy when you are, are leading towards masters and doctorates in vocational pedagogy. But in the old days you had the social division between workshop on the one side, and then you had something called vocational theory connected to the um, to the classroom, uh, not to the workshop. And then you had general theory 
absolutely um, in the classrooms away from vocational theory. My vocational theory is, of course, full of general theory, but it was separate and but very often could be in classrooms or could be in workshops. Okay, that's, um, I have said that workshop uh, hands-on learning was the center of learning. Uh, and uh, you can say that you see very well the contradictions between different ways of learning in this, uh, in this, um, slide which I'm showing here. Um, <clears throat> one thing was that the, the vocational teachers had a double praxis background. They had been trained in their trade through vocational schools and apprenticeship on the manual labor market. Then they trained as teachers in vocational pedagogy in the university college. And I also ended up teaching in that university college in Oslo. Um, oi, oi, hello, yeah. Um, and uh, there I was teaching them on the masters and on the doc and, and doctoral thesis from other parts of the world too. But I will return to that matter a little bit later. You can say that one of my main findings in my research in the vocational sector over the past decades, it's uh, many, many years, is that students and apprentices um, in the vocational trades prospered and learned when they were in activity in the workshops, in the vocational school, or as apprentices in the workplaces, while at the same time, they found no meaning or relevance to the many hours spent in classrooms for vocational education. They dropped out. Um, in many places today, all over, we have seen an, an enormous exp expansion of the educational system. So today in Norway, uh, young people are expected to complete 13 years of formal schooling before they are entering, uh, entering the labor market and or institutions of higher education. 50% of the cohort enter various academic fields and 50% technical vocational fields. This has been part, as I have said, of a global trend, which among other things is built upon the belief that the expansion of equal access and rights to higher education would solve the class contradictions in society. Equality through education and social justice has been the slogans. Might be not so much today, but it was very strong after the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> I have, I'm saying that research into these realities has actually uh, shown how complex these questions are. Norway's upper secondary schooling is marked by a de decrease in workshop instruction and an increase in more abstract uh, general curriculum. Learning difficulties and dropout rates have been substantial both in secondary schools and in higher education during the past decades. This I think is not only in Norway, I think we know it from many places in the world. Um, I um, think that you can change the, the yes, the next. I, yes, <clears throat> you know, I, did, I made a huge research project in the eighties and because uh, vocational students, apprentices, was not visible in the, in the, you can say in the statistics, they were not visible in the, 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 the research world. I actually 
interviewed 1,617 apprentices in five different country, uh, uh, cities in Norway. And, um, I, and then I also was an apprentice myself, um, both in a mechanical engineering factory and also went into the vocational school, not as a counselor as I had been before, but as a, an apprentice in the printing class. I will, so that was the way I combined, you can say, what we at that time called quantitative and qualitative research. Might be we even do that today. Uh, quite, and you use the same uh, uh, concepts. And one of the, the results um, of this research project, uh, I couldn't, it took me a long time to understand that. 89% of these 1,617 apprentices, nearly all the apprentices at, uh, uh, who were in the mechanical factory and in, in the graphics class, which I was participating in, uh, said that they didn't want, they wanted to learn in the workplace and not in the school system. And you know that me as an academic who had been loving to learn, <laughs> loving to read all this thing you have as privileges, I will say, in the world, I could not understand uh, at all <laughs> that 89% of them prefer to learn in, uh, in workplaces. And you can say it was when I went into the, uh, the uh, this open questions on the empirical in my, my 1617 apprentices, I got more of a grasp of uh, what um, uh, what this was all about. And they was, was much wiser from my point of view than the politicians or my, my you can see many colleagues who had no experience from the the, the world of, um, of um, vocational education and apprenticeship. And he, here you see a, a couple of um, um, citations. One says, schools gives you no insight into the actual reality of work and how things develop. By and large, school grinds you down with all its theoretical subjects. School doesn't cut the mustard, neither for the craftsman nor for the ad academic. I hope you follow my, my way of thinking on this. Yes. Uh, no, I, I have prepared, uh, you know, uh, th this uh, quite well, <laughs> to say. Uh, I hope that you follow me uh, in what I'm saying, even from this little Norwegian society. And uh, can you take put on the next, uh, uh, yeah. And I, I said um, in many ways that, uh, uh, why is this, uh, uh, why is this happening? And uh, we have actually a situation in Norway where, um, there it is actually 30% of student, students in upper secondary vocational education that drops out. And I, as I said, uh, it was so many who couldn't stand to be in the school. And I have asked the question, how to make learning meaningful for all young people in, in turn of leading fulfilling lives in whatever profession they are entering. Uh, and I think that this is at the core of discussions, not only across Europe, but also elsewhere in the world today. I have been having a lot of contacts in Latin America, which of course faces all, all kinds of horrible uh, situations. And I have worked in Africa and uh, to Japan. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I, I have experienced in all these places is that they all have workshops 
uh, as a learning area in, in the vocational schools. It's a variation, of course, in different places, but the workshop you find in, in all kinds of, um, of um, vocational, educa vo vocational schools, uh, in a, when they, wherever you are. And the next, uh, yeah, um, I have uh, worked a lot with the social division of knowledge. And um, I have said that there are contradictions between intellectual and manual labor, work of hand and work of mind and heart, vocational and general education, workshop vocational learning traditions, and general classroom traditions. And they are, are there wherever you go. Um, and you can say that um, I think I started to grasp the depth of this problematic when I began, began to work with labor market questions, centering on the political economy of knowledge, which led to working with the texts of Adam Smith and Karl Marx and Alfred Son Retell. Both Adam Smith and Karl Marx treated the division of knowledge in their major work, and it was in many ways the center of the work of Marx in his work, uh, in his philosophical works. Um, but it was actually Alfred Sonretel. Uh, can you tape it on the next? Uh, yeah. Uh, who, yeah, um, he was the one who had worked, uh, who said something which uh, made me see, uh, say Eureka. I understood, then I understood more about the social division of knowledge. And I understood how it operated and also why it operated the way it did. And I have a very deep admiration for people who, who work in, and, and, and work for a long time on the problem. I think he started this book on the, uh, in the, during the First World War in 1917, finished it in 1974. I think that's many years. Yeah. And he, uh, he, he actually, then he got, uh, he was then living in England, I think, and, and, um, but, he, and, but he moved back to Germany. Um, he was uh, was uh, much in Eng in England during the uh, before the Second World War and uh, and um, also after. Uh, he says about the social division of knowledge. One must take into consideration that the philosophical tradition in itself is a product or the division between intellectual and manual labor. And since its inception, starting with Pythagoras, Herodotus, and Parmenides, it has been safeguarded by intellectuals, for intellectuals, in a, a, inaccessible to manual labor. Um, I could put on the next uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I think this is uh, highly visible in uh, in um, uh, the the development of the educational theory and what I have called the general vocational divide. Uh, the general theory is served not as a useful tool, but as if it is not connected to their everyday lives. The hegemonic organization of learning is learning, kills their curiosity, then praxis is uh, divided from earlier stored knowledge. And for me, I think that the cultivation of, the, of curiosity in human beings is the most important driving force for learning. Okay. Um, 
I think actually, I'm in some ways an optimist because I think that this social division of knowledge is actually challenged in over times in new ways. I think that the development of information technology has brought revolutionary changes to the work of the hand and the mind in all practical professions, as well as raising challenges to the scientific work of the art of teaching, because teaching, I think, is a, is a real art. The expansion of um, education in the formal education institutions, uh, institutions of education after World War II has reinforced the fundamental questions about learning and teaching in society. And I ask, is is it so that educational institutions are lagging behind what is happening in the labor market? This is, uh, I, I don't have the answer. It's a, uh, we are doing a pedagogy <coughs> here. Oh, yes, it's nice. I see, you know, um, uh, good friends. I am uh, very happy to, to see that, <laughs> yeah. Yes, so I will say that the labor market demands new ways of solving the contradictions in the educational system. And of course, we all know the Lisbon strategy, the action and development plan devised in 2000 as a blueprint for the economy of the European Union. Its aim was to make the European Union the most competitive and knowledge-based economy in the world, is, is capable of a sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater social cohesion. And you know, we have no, we, we operate with the concepts, the knowledge society, the learning economy, innovation was to be the motor of social exchange. But I will say that uh, with the economic crisis, I'm not talking about the, the other crisis right now. We see that the goals are far from ful ful fulfilled. You know that also in uh, year 2000, uh, the least part of the Lisbon strategy was to reduce the dropout rate of, uh, uh, of um, education. That was one of the, of the goals. And um, in many ways, uh, uh, Lisbon papers, they stressed new attention on vocational education and the dropout rates all over Europe. Um, I would say in many ways, vocational education has not been much part of the research agenda in Norway. Um, you can say during the, the past, uh, the late past century, but this has changed. The, the Norwegian minister, now called the Minister of Knowledge, introduced the parliamentary report on education in 2013 and emphasized that more attention will be paid to vocational subjects. The government intended to re reduce the dropout problems. The, the Norwegian official report manifested that 30% of the students did not uh, finish upper secondary school in time and um, uh, uh, the dropouts uh, there, there, as you see here, yes, more in the vocational, uh, vocational side of upper secondary education than it was in the, in the general stream. And what we have experienced, the more expansion of academic, academic classrooms, the more dropouts. Many, and of course, this is a lot of individual disasters. Many young people have lost uh, confidence in their ability to learn. Um, 
And I will say that right now, research money has been, yes, I say for the past 15 years, has been channeled towards educational matters and vocational education is central in this field. We have seen a greater interest in what is now called evidence-based research and new attention uh, is actually, people are asking, is 13 years of schooling remote from working cl class, is uh, from working life, um, could, we, could we question this? And um, uh, you can say that the, it, they have also become aware of how many, much it costs with these dropouts. Uh, it's, it's a question of million of the, millions of dollars for, for each cohort. I think maybe I should give the floor to you. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you so much. This has been a very good introduction to what we will know. At least uh, I uh, want to ask with my questions to go deeper into this uh, separation of knowledge, you know, the, the social division of knowledge. And as a result in educational, you know, context, uh, unfortunately, or maybe, I don't know, not unfortunately, we have a separation of learning in workshop and learning in classroom. Liv, what, what is this difference? Is, is there a difference between these uh, learning types, learning uh, styles in workshop or in uh, classrooms? And as, as I understand the division between these two is rooted back to uh, social division of knowledge. Can you, can you go deeper into this? A little? a little bit please i will try thank you so much for the question and um, i will say that um, yeah i would, first i would like to say that uh, um, my first uh, yes my first publication in english had a title from hand to mind it was published in a publication called the uh, critical pedagogy and um, um, cultural poverty and the poor forward is very connected to to the whole discussion we have in this webinar. Yes. Uh, uh, we have heard Henry Shiru, and of course we are have very many of us uh, had a deep uh, base into the work of the great um, Paulo Freire. Yes. Um, I was then, when I was working on my doctoral uh, research, I was a visiting professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education in Toronto, Canada. And I worked together with some excellent scholars, among them the editor of the book, Professor uh, David Livingston. And as a small anecdote, I would like to, to to connect it a bit to me being here today. Because as a result of the chapter in the book, I got a letter from the University of Malta. I have the pleasure to see Ronald here today. I'm, I'm very pleased. And uh, um, he, he actually wrote me, Ronald Sutama, and said, what you are saying here gives indication towards the education of the future. Uh, and then uh, he actually had written me, dear sir. And of course, it's not very easy to know that Leave is the name of the woman. Hello, Ronald. Yeah, and, uh, and you know that um, uh, I wrote back rather shyly and saying, dear sir, I think, I'm not a sir, I'm a woman. <laughs> and that I, uh, that started, the, you know, a, a friendship. Uh -huh. We wrote yeah. together and I also met Peter Mayo, who is also an inspiration to my work on 
you can say the social division of knowledge and how we can look upon new possibilities for the future. Yes, and then I'll just tell you a little bit in relationship to the social division of knowledge and go back to OISI. OISI, Department of Sociology of Education, was also a center for questioning the development of the social division of knowledge from a standpoint of women. I was very inspired and started to grasp more of the complex contradictions between vocational education on one side, academic education, and also the contradictions between whose knowledge, whose science, which I think is one of the big questions that has come up on the, the agenda during the past 40 years. Very important uh, question has, uh, uh, has been posed. And women have entered the scientific world during the past decades, and they have actually posed new fundamental questions to this traditional organization of knowledge. Women have entered as participants in the academic positions, and they have presented theories critical of the prevalent ways of thinking in both social and natural sciences. That it's also many men who has done the same thing, but this is a, also a field that I have been very interested in. Um, and with, with, in my own field, sociology, uh, the Canadian sociologist, Dorothy Smith, critique of the development of Western science has had a widespread influence during the recent decades. She so shows that how the central fe the feature of rulership in Western society is, is um, the role of objef objectified knowledge, as you say, or textually mediated discourses far away from people's everyday life. And uh, she has been following this up, and her last book is called The Sociology for People. She's today 93 years old, going, still going very strong, and got the, actually the Order of Canada last year for her, her work. In, um, and we are still um, very close. We, we meet it a lot. But uh, to sum up, women's voices have put new questions on the agenda, which are important in our research and for the, in the education of the future. Um, I think that uh, might be... I give the floor to you, Fatma. Okay, thank you, Liv. This is a, a very good explanation of your, your friendship, your solidarity with Dorothy Smith. And you, you are becoming a good model for us, for women in science, maybe in praxis. Thank you for this. And my, my next question uh, will be related to the first question, you know, this separation of knowledge and praxis or learning in workshop uh, versus learning in classroom and social division of knowledge kind of things. How would you relate this separation, this distinction to the situation today, to the problems of uh, you know, pandemic, learning in pandemic era, learning through online, and you know, all students are deprived of their schools. They are not uh, either either in classroom mm -hmm. or in in workshops. You know, mm -hmm. no practice, no knowledge. Maybe only we have these these screens, this online learning, online education, and uh, do you think this will increase the gap? between these two issues? Um, I will say that in many ways you are here uh, uh, posing a very complicated question. Uh, I do think that you can uh, organize workshops on the internet as we are doing right now. This is a workshop. 
in many ways. Uh, uh, and I think also that the digital world has given us new opportunities. I remember sitting in Oslo, sharing my knowledge with students at the University of Tampere, Finland, many years ago. At that time, I had to go to a studio and work from there. Today, I sit here in my own home um, using Zoom and also learning new things, like learning how to, to, to operate the, the PowerPoint on the net. Mm -hmm. But I'm very happy you do it from your side, I will say. Um, yeah. And this is amazing, but it cannot replace human contact where I could really see your eyes and really see all the faces where you could interrupt me and say, we don't understand this, Liv, please explain. Uh, this is, um, um, of course, you cannot do that on the net, but a little bit, I see your faces, so, so I can follow if you follow me or not, a little bit, but uh, not, uh, not all the way. Um, I will say, but I, I would like to, to yeah, draw your attention to another situation. And that is how the pan pandemic has created serious complications in the practical world of vocational students and apprentices. Most of them are more advanced using the net world than I am. And they are all so using the, the, the internet in relationship to their trades. But they cannot learn their trade to be a hairdresser or a plumber virtually. They need hands on experience and good mentors and fellow travel, travelers. travelers. Mm -hmm. um, the same with the medical doctor apprentice who is going to transplant the kidney. He or she needs hands-on work, needs an internship or hands-on learning with very, very good mentors, that they have good mentors to guide them. I... Uh, uh, have um, through my praxis with teaching master students to write their thesis, I've been uh, um, arguing that learning by doing and through cooperation with other students may, may, may go on uh, also in this uh, situation of the pa pandemic. Of course, it creates challenges. But it might, the, the situation we are in might also create new solutions and um, on how to, to uh, practice virtual learning in many fields. You, I think that uh, you can also practice, you can say mentoring, for example. You can really practice mentoring on, uh, on the net. Mm. Yes, uh, my dear Fatma, you will uh, yeah. have made some good questions for me, and I have been inspired by your questions uh, yeah. to do uh, to, to follow up your questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we just try to reflect, you know, our participants' common common problems that we are having now because this is this is the very big question now what will happen to education, you know? But as, as you said, it is possible. There are some ways, even though big challenges in online education, there are virtual learning uh, situations and there are simulations, for example, maybe in operations, in medical operations, in mm -hmm. pilot education, for yeah. example, there are some simulations. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is also related to the technology and how a country, how an education system adopted technology in a, in a good way, you know, to, to give service to students. Okay, thank you. Let's let's continue with another question. Now, can you uh, explain some uh, implementations in a Scandinavian region? You know, Scandinavian countries 
about the adult education, adults taking place in, in, for example, vocational and technical education. Is it a common practice? Is it a public education uh, practice? Mm -hmm. And how, how, how does it work? Yeah, you know that the, uh, in many ways, I, I, I have in some of my earlier works, I have argued that vocational education and adult education are two sides of the same coin. That has been one point of departure, which I have uh, talked about before. We also have something called fork high schools in, in Scandinavia, which is also hands-on learning. Learning in cooperation has been, been the main features. Uh, I would say that in many ways, adult education has not been given much attention in uh, the research world in Norway during the last decades. Uh, adult education courses have often been tied to a, unemployment. Unemployed workers have, have been offered adult education courses when they have lost their jobs. Um, research shows, however, that unemployed, uh, unemployed men um, may prefer a job and not adult education courses. Um, women uh, might have been more open to adult education courses because the labor market has changed enormously. The health and service sector has expanded. Women's work in the home is moved uh, to the labor market, uh, market. So they have got new possibilities for working. Uh, uh, which very often is related to, to that uh, adult education. They take a course and they can get uh, a semi-skilled semi work mm -hmm. in, uh, in an old age home or yes, on the, with health. And um, I will say that, of course, we have had the situation that reskilling of workers has is part of adult education and ro royal commissions and proposals in parliament or, on skills and competence have addressed this problematic again and again. The last proposal, the la learning throughout life passed uh, in government in April this year and it had at um, as a goal that no one should be left behind due to lack of competence. And of course, with all the drop of problems and, uh, and th that has been uh, quite, um, quite a problem uh, over the past 20 or 30 years, which is discussed in Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Norway reported to OECD some years ago that 400,000 people who had been through 10 year old compulsory schooling uh, had not got the grasp of the most elementary abilities in reading, writing, and mathematics. This is why we need to th rethink for another educational system. But then it is very many contradictions between, uh, you can say, the labor movement on the other side, or the conservatives on the other, on the other side, on this question, which I cannot go into today. This is, uh, uh, this would be take many hours to discuss, but uh, I, I just mentioned it. And we, as you know, 400,000 people, and we do not have more than 5 million people in this little country. And I think to sum up uh, that uh, adult education today is also tied to upgrading a lot of youngsters who have dropped, dropped out of school, especially from vocational education. But uh, of course, I'm, I know that the, the complexity of hands-on learning and class long, long classroom learning are very present in adult education today, with the same contradictions you can, obs uh, you can ob observe in vocational education. 
as I say, the situation is ripe for change. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you for this explanation. It's it's a deep subject. I know. Uh, uh, we have the same situation in Turkey, and uh, there's a lot to discuss. Okay, let's let's continue with uh, your approach to vocational and technical education. Uh, what is unique to your studies? What is unique to your approach and to your modeling of vocational and technical education is that you relate it uh, with Friere, Divi, and Montessori models, you know, their pedagogies mm -hmm. are uh, in, in your approach, in your modeling of vocational education. Maybe mm -hmm. you are the first to, to combine these two, uh, I mean, the uh, vocational and technical education mm -hmm. with these uh, pedagogues uh, mm -hmm. in education. So can you, can you open it up a little bit? Yeah, yes. You know, due to this crisis, uh, I I think it really in, uh, intensifies the need for change, and you know that the, the new concepts, which uh, you know that I've been part of developing, and I'm not sure how happy I am about the concepts, but uh, I don't know. Uh, um, anything better and they have been quite uh, quite uh, well received when we with colleagues in africa but i have used the concept vocational pedagogy and vocational didactics and the pedagogy of professions is actually used in scandinavia related to higher education and they are as i say growing out of the need for rethinking learning mm -hmm. and the art of teaching in fundamental ways. Medical students for the time being protest the remoteness from praxis and demand other ways of learning. They criticize the lecturing tradition of medical professors and once in a while they use their names when they when they criticize the persons. So mm -hmm. the contradictions are demanding change, new ways to learn a new understanding in educational science. And of course, I have, uh, the, the inspiration for me has been, of course, Dewey, Freire and Montessori. People has asked these fundamental questions, how people learn. And uh, of course, Levi Gotsky, I will return to Levi Gotsky because he has met, meant a lot to my understanding. Uh, you see that uh, uh, I think, yes, uh, Pablo Freire says theory without practice will be mere abstract thinking, just as practice without theory will be reduced to naive action. Wonderful saying. And I am actually using, of course, Praxis, and I'm so I'm, I am. We are, are trying to develop uh, because theory is a very, very abstract concept. I've been tr starting to use the concept stored knowledge. You understand the difference? Uh, uh, yes. Um, and one thing that, of course, you all know uh, the banking concept of education for. Um, from Friday, and of course, uh, the savings account to be filled with inf information, the, the ob objectifying um, ways of, the, of, of serving, you can say, uh, learning. I think that uh, 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 Friday suggested there's a, so, uh, a Socratic approach, a pedagogy of questioning, and it was actually a very very good colleague in in Spain who sent me, you know, the, the this uh, um, this paper, the, this paper who is who is an interview with the wife of Friday after he dies, and I thought that was very, very rewarding. And that is, we sent the palop, and I see that he said today too. That's very nice. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
And then uh, I think that, of course, Pablo Freire, Dewey, um, you, you can say that uh, uh, his uh, next, you can put and on the... Yeah, and also Vygotsky. I'm returning yeah. to Vygotsky, can I? John Dewey, learning by doing. Uh, John Dewey, uh, yeah. of course, is, uh, no, this is Montessori. Do we, uh, are we starting to lose time? Are we... Oh, okay, we, we, are, we, are, we are fine with timing. Okay, good, good. Then I, then, and you are not too bored, I hope, any of you. I hope no, you are... It's, okay. it's, it's going so well. Is it? Thank you. And you know, yes, we, 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 John Dewey, of course, learning by doing is a very known concept from his uh, laboratory school. And he pro, pro, uh, proclaims, and this is a form of fruitless theory that uh, about this theory praxis concept. So that stands opposed to practice. Real scientific theory is located within the bonds of praxis and functions as the impetus for the ex for expansion, it provides the directions towards new possibilities, and that's what we need to think about new possibilities. Okay, um, I think that I want to mention just uh, um, Maria Montessori. Uh, okay, very shortly, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, she is actually. Um, you know that she was a woman a pioneer, both in the medical profession and in revolutionary, uh, revolutionary in pedagogy. She was the first woman to be allowed into the study of medicine in Italy in 1896, and she's world f uh, famous as a philosopher and practitioner in educational science. Her devotion to research and practice among the pride children has the pride uh, has spread its inf influence, of course, beyond uh, in Italy. And you find her work and her practice here in Scandinavia, as you do in Latin America and, uh, and Africa. And she has been uh, a mentor in many ways for many educational scientists. She had a strong belief in everybody's ability to learn, and this is important that you learn from praxis to, from, from birth to, to grave, I think, yeah? and was deeply, deeply concerned about the teacher's ability to adjust and find, you can say, the, the, where the student are and how to develop to, uh, knowledge in, together with students in themselves. A teacher actually should be a guide and a mentor, yes. Um, and you can say that uh, uh, the next, uh, we, are, we are getting a little bit closer to, yeah. The next okay. step, yeah. And one person who has, uh, who has actually inspired me is labor market theory, as I've said. And this book of Halbert Appelbaum, um, also got me to, to get the foundation for uh, continuing to work uh, when you work in, in doing mentoring for master and doctoral thesis, that you can use the ideas of learning from stored knowledge through praxis and cooperation with other students. And he, he says, even in the realm of pure ideas, whether it be through the activity of writing or of teaching, one learns best when one is in activity. Uh, in activity. Can you ask me, yeah? Um, should we? Okay, my, let, uh, let's, okay let's, let's continue with my last question. Maybe actually you mentioned about uh, this praxis. Uh, in your presentation in the first part, uh, but uh, please let me call this practice, your, your initiation in Africa, in Uganda, praxis of praxis, okay? This is, this is a model, you initiated a master's program in vocational and technical education, uh, and, the, and the philosophy of the 
of the master program, this master's program is uh, quite different from the existing ones, right? It is, it is a result of a good cooperation, first of all. It's an international uh, cooperative work. It is, as I said before, a praxis of praxis. And it is critical pedagogy based and vocational and technical education based. So the, maybe a few words, a few, a few sentences about this, this uh, master's program, Liv, as, as a last word. After that, uh, we are having a question here on the chat from our participants. We will pose mm -hmm. these questions to you. Okay, I would just uh, very briefly mention to you one thing that, of course, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, Levi Gotsky has in many ways answered, uh, you can put on the PowerPoint 22, uh, you find it, yeah. And uh, he, uh, I think that he, the Cultural History uh, uh, Kill School of Moscow has also be, is the basis for understanding how human beings learn and how they have uh, developed through activity and cooperation. These are the most, um, uh, uh, you can say most important concepts in, in this way of working also of, in Uganda. And of course, that the split between hand, hands, mind, and body is a social construction. We have got much further today in our understanding that it's not, it's, that it is a, a social construction. And, and Vygotsky says, neither the man, nor, uh, the mind, nor the hand can do much alone. The deed is brought through fruition through activity and cooperation. Okay, we will now go to, to Uganda. Um, uh, I, I have, uh, uh, yes, another thing I've just mentioned is that of course, the work of Paulo Freire and Levi Gotsky goes like hand in glove. They, you understand what I mean? Uh, uh, Freire says, I do not think with my mind, I'd rather think with my whole body, with all my emotions, my feelings, my intuitions. I think, think with my common sense experiences, with the lived facts that all are really perceived. Are st they are still present in my life, and I think with my reflexes consciousness as well. Okay, let's go to Africa, to Uganda. Yeah, this is actually the start in uh, at Kiambogo University uh, in 2009, and of course I I could uh, spend uh, two hours talking about this. It was a very rich experience. This is you see on the left side here. Uh, my counterpart, Dr. Habib Kato. And of course, we were different, but we had a very, we, we, we had a very fun time, I will say, uh, in many mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And here you see the first cohort. This is students from, um, from South Sudan, a very, very troubled society, and uh, of course, Uganda. And we should try to have the division 50% women, 50% them, men, uh, seven, seven of them were from South Sudan and they were hardworking, excellent uh, students who took to the ideas of, uh, of um, uh, workshop pedagogy, vocational pedagogy in a fantastic way. Of course, I had also 20 years of experience with doing this work in Norway. Can you uh, give me the next? Um, uh, this is actually master's degree in vocational pedagogy. We built two houses and we were actually three, uh, I would say three persons in the first years who worked there constantly. The, the, of course, going back and forth something, but the, but I don't believe that you go down and give a lecture for a week. You had to live 
with with the, if you are going to build up a program, you can just come in from the north, down to the so-called south, and just say this. You had to do this organically to, together with the, with the students, and uh, we also built two houses uh, uh, where we had the group room. They are the most important. Uh, it is the core of learning. You're following me. Three groups of rooms divided in seven students in each uh, um, group room, and they uh, helped each other, followed each other through. And we said one thing everybody is responsible for, everybody, uh, for everybody's learning. They were forced quotation mark, it was very easy. They were forced to help each other. And that was the core of the group learning work. And of course, can you show me the next, uh, let's, uh, let's, the next. But of course I had been doing this for 20 years in Norway. And here you see, this is a group in Norway, the, the, we are sitting in a group room, small group room in Norway. Justin, which is uh, uh, from uh, from uh, Kampala, from uh, and one of our wonderful mentors who have also followed up uh, doing a, a doctoral degree in Edmonton in Canada. And this is from, from uh, I couldn't find one from, uh, from uh, uh, I mean, the picture from, uh, from down there, from the group, but okay. Uh, the next uh, show, show. Yes, this is what I would say. I've called it here the Bible or the Quran uh, of um, uh, of um, uh, vocational pedagogy, and uh, it's based on equality, complementarity, solidarity, and fidelity. And I would say that Edwin Moses, which I think is with us today too, he, he's, I cry when I think of how the beautiful, and we were very much concerned about placing the whole program in African soil. And he did this in a beautiful way on the, when we were printing this little handbook. And I think this is available. So if anybody is interested, and, all the, and it gives the principles on, in a very, I would say, direct way of how we, how we practice this. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. And then I have to start to say goodbye to you and to, um, to this wonderful group in Kianbogo. We, but we are still in contact and we will be. Uh, back giving a work workshop there a couple of years ago. And this is my next, uh, next um, uh, counterpart. Uh, that was William Apeggio. And this is the first cohort of, uh, of the masters in vocational pedagogy in the huge, I, I think it was uh, 10,000 students there, uh, in the huge ceremony for, um, for um, uh, the, um, Ceremony for um, getting your certificates is that yeah, yeah. It's like very, very, very great. And this is um, one of the other mentors we have had, Joanne Kekimori, who has just finished her doctorate, and yeah, a year ago or something. She is a painter, and um, also a wonderful mentor. Uh, in the program, and both Joanne and, uh, and Justine, which you just saw, have got their doctorates. And what we have found out when we were there, of, uh, it is a deep engagement in vocational pedagogy. It, it has not died out. Uh, and of course, that's um, when, you, when you are doing a job, it's so wonderful to see uh, good results. And that people are, um, um, yes, developing all the time. And then, of course, I just say this, this, um, and this. I think 
this is one of our students from the war north of Norway. He expressed this in a beautiful way. He says, the experience, I think he was a mechanic. The experience I myself had in connection to learning during vocational train, training are relevant to the program in vocational uh, program because the activity itself, that will say writing a thesis uh, is central. You learn using your hands, mind and heart in cooperation with others. It is actually as simple as that. But uh, we also have resistance mm -hmm. to this way of thinking, but uh, it, it is possible to, to promote it in the academic world. Thank you so much for listening. I think that we, we have, I hope we have not used too much time. Uh, uh, that's okay. We are a little bit uh, over time, but uh, we, we have a question from Sk Skander Ali. Uh, Skunder Ali. Uh, it's, it's a long question, actually, and we are having very positive, very good comments from our participants. And we will be sharing these with you through email, if you don't mind. Uh, or would you like to answer this one question, no, but long question now? Or would you like to have it through email? No, How would you prefer it? You do have a little bit of feedback, no? On the same face. Uh, yes, I would like to have the question. Okay. Can you, can you please read it? Sure. So, um, question to Liv. Thanks for all the insights into vocation and adult education in Norway. We are witnessing that modern societies such as Norway are becoming knowledge and or technology intensive. In this context of special, specialization and academization through formal schooling is becoming a necessity in order to become included in this changing landscape of job market. How can we then discuss idea of meaningful learning in this context? Can we think that old idea of meaningfulness as ex exemplified with workshop tradition still be valid in the context of specialized societies. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it is a, a complex and wide question. And but uh, it is one thing that I, I, I think I said. I think that the, the labor market is far ahead of what is happening in the educational system. And that's why I think that might be, uh, we have to pose new revolutionary questions to how we organize uh, learning per, per se, from what we know now of, of, of how learning um, um, is happening uh, through your, the use of your hands, mind and heart and how you should take praxis um, I will say whatever you do as a point of departure. And I think that myself, I, I was very lucky, John Dewey, he had quite an influence also in Turkey, I know, where he was uh, in Turkey in the, in the 20s, 30s. And he became an honorary professor in, in Norway at the University of Oslo, my alma mater, in 19... Uh, 46 and I you know that my teacher which I had for seven years uh, in the in the what called folk school at that it was called folk school she actually organized us we were sitting in groups of four and I th I think that she was so bright I think she she integrated uh, the persons who didn't, uh, for example, was a slow learner with, with persons who were a fast learner. So they cooperated with each other and, and helped. And, you know, these things can change all the time. Somebody can ver be very good on, uh, for example, in computer, internet computer science and uh, uh, 
we can i can be a luddite and then uh, you know uh, they can teach me what they know no and i can so i i think that we need so much more dyna dynamic thinking in how we organize teaching and learning i say we need an, a revolution mm -hmm. i hope that uh, that covers a little bit. It was Kader Demirsi who, who asked the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question and for the answer. Skinder, uh, you participate in our, our events. I, I know you. I hope you are doing well. Okay. Uh, Liv, thank you for this uh, event, for this uh, inspirational talk today and it was so good to have you and to have our participants from all over the world and again uh, we we have a very very nice global thursday talks event here through this praxis because we we call this praxis this is our intellectual praxis mm -hmm. and you you contributed us with your talk with with your perspectives uh, from a different point of view, you uh, actually introduced us vocational and technical education and its connection with critical pedagogy, its connection with, with philosophy, with uh, all, all types of theories, you know. Thank you. Thank you for this and uh, thank you for uh, attending. Uh, this meeting of Global Thursday talks to our the participants and we would like to see you in our next event in the 10th of December. We will hosting Wayne Ross from Canada mm -hmm. and uh, you can reach us through our social media, through our YouTube channel and you can you can add your comments you can add your questions always because we share your questions with the with the speakers with our guests even after after the talk okay thank you take care and stay negative mm -hmm. stay negative in your tests yes okay <laughs> thanks a lot bye bye to everyone thank you for bye. listening bye bye yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sad to leave you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. You close it, don't you? Yes, I'm going to close it. I'm going to save the chat. <laughs> Actually, okay. people were writing comments. I was exp uh, I was waiting for them. Okay. It was amazing, Liv. Thank you very much. I hope so. Yeah. I am. I'm pleased to see you all. Yeah. Yeah.